There are a few names that are widely considered synonymous with classic horror. Dracula, Frankenstein, the Wolfman. Each of these conjure up a specific entity thanks to the fairly consistent canon of each of these storylines over the years, the histories and interpretations of those characters is pretty easy to recall on a general basis. Most people know what the characters look like and the general beats of their nuances. But what about when the canon is so wildly inconsistent that there is no conjurable rule set, no easily recognized modus operandi? What's up classic monsters? I'm Jaden and today we're going to talk about the Invisible Man. Part 1. History. So in today's video, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the origins, histories, and multiple installments in the Invisible Man identity, and hopefully, at the end of it, after going through all of the data, come up with a once and for all rule set, point on point, of notes that separates an Invisible Man movie from a movie about the Invisible Man. The year is 1897. Edison patents the kinetoscope, both Amelia Earhart and Goebbels are born, and in the height of the Klondike gold rush, Bram Stoker publishes Dracula. But in the background during that year, something else was going on. Little by little, a popular London periodical called Pearson's Weekly was releasing a serialized horror science fiction story, a chapter at a time, entitled The Man at the Coach and Horses. It was wildly popular, and by the time the year was over, all of the collected serialized chapters had been brought together and published in a novelized form, entitled The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells. The story follows Griffin, a medical student who dropped out to pursue optic science, who discovers a chemical compound that can render the refractive index of human skin to the same as air, thus making them invisible. But, plot twist in the way all of these sorts of things go, he has no idea how to turn himself back. His newfound anonymity leads him down a disturbing and violent rabbit hole where he questions the nature of morals and slowly descends further and further away from the common standard of what is good and what is bad. 36 years later, Universal Studios releases The Invisible Man starring Claude Rains. The film is a fairly instantaneous hit receiving a significant amount of praise for its special effects. Fun fact, the way they achieved the Invisible Man look was they put Claude Rains, who was notably claustrophobic, in a full morph suit made out of black velvet, and then made all of the backgrounds black velvet so that when he was filmed against it, he would blur in. Velvet didn't really reflect any light, so it made a fairly seamless transition. 1940 saw the return of the Invisible Man, starring Vincent Price. The entry into the canon, which takes the first steps away from the main character is bad guy perspective. In this film, Vincent Price's character tries to use his invisibility to prove himself innocent of murder. Again, a decently successful film, and it was nominated for an Oscar for special effects. That same year, Universal unleashes The Invisible Woman, a completely unrelated story about a woman who turns invisible, fights some gangsters, and has a baby at the end. Two years later, in 1942, the U.S. military propaganda film The Invisible Agent, in which the grandson of the original Griffin is brought on by the U.S. military to kill Hitler. And of course, as always, kill Hitler. Hijinks ensue. John Hall, the star of The Invisible Agent, was brought back two years later as the film franchise sort of returned to its original, more violent roots to star in The Invisible Man's Revenge. Then there was a Vincent Price cameo as The Invisible Man at the very end of Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. I'm not kidding when I say I am finding every version of this character that isn't straight up parody, I mean it. Then in 1951, we get Abbott and Costello meet the Invisible Man, not starring Vincent Price, so it's kind of a Bruce Banner sort of moment. Again, we're back to the innocent man trying to clear his name of murder. In 1960, 17 African nations are freed, the first televised anime is released, Eisenhower signs the Civil Rights Act, and the amazing Invisible Man is released into the world. Seven years later, Mad Monster Party is released, and the Invisible Man is in it, so I guess technically it counts. And then... Silence. Nothing. After 70 years of constant abuse, decanonization, story alterations, remakes, reboots, all was quiet. Perhaps it looked like H.G. Wells' beloved work would finally be left alone. 
No. 1998, The Invisible Kid. It is exactly what you think it is. Kid doing a science slash magic experiment turns himself invisible. 80s hijinks ensue. John Carpenter signed some paperwork getting him involved in 1992. Memoirs of an Invisible Man is released. To be reductionist about it because we have a lot to get through, um, Chevy Chase plays the Invisible Man who turns invisible and does not want to join the CIA. That is essentially the plot. Alright, we're catching up to present now, so stick with me. 2000. PlayStation 2 is released, DeviantArt is launched, and Kevin Bacon makes The Hollow Man. A very adult rendition of The Invisible Man that brings back the premise of him being unquestionably the bad guy. Also introducing a level of sci-fi to the films that previously either a lack of demand or ability to create didn't really allow. Six years later, Hollow Man 2 is released, and it was fine kind of skewed my statistics a little because spoilers for Hollow Man 2, there's more than one invisible person. Then we've got an invisible man appearance in the timeless classic The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, and Griffin the Invisible Man as a recurring character in the Hotel Transylvania series. Over the course of time we've also had three TV shows, and that brings us up to the 2020 Invisible Man remake released by Universal Studios. Decidedly returned to the horror genre, it is, to be short, an excellent film and an excellent remake. Keeps important classic tenets while being entertaining and bringing the story into a more modern era. And little did I know that it would be the last movie I would see in theaters until at time of recording, to be determined. The original story was written the same year as a global pandemic. The remake came out the same year as a global pandemic. The world is weird like that. 133 years, 16 different actors, three TV shows. So, who is the Invisible Man? To help you guys out with this, I did watch every single version of the Invisible Man movies. And I took notes and noted differences and similarities and uh, that brings us to part two, statistics. So, if we take all of the Invisible Man versions and compile them together, which ones win out over the others? A lot of the story structures and points repeat in multiple renditions, so I have taken note of all of the most important story elements and character develop points, blended them all together, and come up with a suitable, definitive, final answer on who is the Invisible Man. Also, for the purpose of this video, we are foregoing original privilege and just kind of using the book as another entry into the canon. Obviously, for most things, I would probably go with the earliest version of something being the most true, but that isn't nearly as fun. So, statistically speaking, The Invisible Man is male, given that only one portrayal of The Invisible Man has been female. He is a scientist, but he does not make the serum himself. He is related to the creator of the original serum. His goals are world domination, using a homemade invisible army, returning to visibility, and generally to do crime. The serum is applied through injection. It is reversed via blood transfusion. Over the course of the storyline, he is shot at least once, lights something on fire, most notably a lab or barn or lab in a barn, causes at least one explosion, and despite definitively being the villain of the movie, survives to the end credits. And, as a special treat for you guys, following our theme of statistics, I actually took headshots of all of the actors and the one actress who has played the Invisible Man and compiled them to show you what the Invisible Man would look like. What, what did you expect? But this is only one method for coming to the definitive decision about who the Invisible Man is, and by the nature of it, using statistics and compiling our fact sheet from all of the different versions inherently suggests that all of the versions are as valid as any of the other versions, and everything has the same amount of weight. What we could do instead is focus more on the story and the purpose of the original work, and build a framework of tone and theme around that. In other words, instead of categorizing the Invisible Man as a character, categorizing the Invisible Man as a commentary. What is the point, and then as long as that particular rendition fits into that particular point, then it is a movie of the Invisible Man, as opposed to just a movie featuring invisible people. What is the point of the Invisible Man? Part 3. Purpose. All the big recurring monsters that you know by name, that you can recognize in an instant, are immortalized because for some reason or another, 
their story structures and basic identities are always going to be relevant. There is always some struggle that can be applied to those stories, some lesson that those stories will always need to impart. No matter if it's a hundred years ago or a hundred years from now, something will be relevant. So what is that for Griffin? The original story was inspired by The Legend of the Ring of Ganji, a story from Plato's Republic that essentially outlines that if morals are socially constructed and enforced socially, then the ability to act with total anonymity would make one free of all consequence and therefore free of morals. Essentially, a god. And the original story of the Invisible Man was written on the coattails of a decade that had seen unprecedented scientific achievement. In the less than 10 years prior, the world had seen the first electric chair execution, the first airlock, four-wheeled front-engined cars, the introduction of psychopathology, escalators, the first successful human open-heart surgery, the first discovery of thermite reaction, anti-cholera vaccines, the first diesel engine, the Lumiere cinematograph, ferris wheels, toasters, x-rays, epinephrine, isolated helium, radio transmission, and aspirin all came into existence in the 1890s. In less than a decade, the concept of what was and wasn't possible became nothing more than an assumption, with discoveries and experiments proving on a weekly, if not daily basis, that which was previously thought impossible to be possible. And with such huge strides in scientific discovery, there was very little motivation to examine whether or not the steps that humankind was taking into the future were steps that they should be taking. So maybe the Invisible Man should be viewed as allegory, preaching that progress without morality is only going to backfire and curse humanity as a whole. Perhaps that version is more relevant in modern sense even than it was in H.G. Wells' time. That anonymity in and of itself is a type of power that should not be wielded lightly. What does the story say about humankind? That we're only good for fear of retribution or retaliation? That without carrot or stick, we will only act out of self-interest? That our main motivators are greed and selfishness? And that at its core, humankind is inherently sadistic? Or should we take it as a gentle reminder that no matter what the future brings, acting solely for ourselves will inherently pull back all of us. That unless we are working forward with the good of everyone in mind, we aren't working forward at all. Anyway, thanks for watching. That's the video on the Invisible Man. Um, like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff that YouTubers tell you to do. I post new videos every Wednesday. I stream on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. At time of recording, we're currently working our way through the Resident Evil saga. We're still on the first one, though, and tank controls are not something I'm good at. Thanks for watching. See you next time.